but I felt like it was appropriate to this audience and this place because it's about um, a friend of Ginsburg's. I'll find somebody to sit up here. Uh, named uh, Cassidy. Strung out and shaking, he was, pacing distractedly about the clutter of his house upstairs in the barn, poking amongst the books and bottles and cobwebs and dirt dauber nests, trying to remember what he'd done with his colored glasses, his special glasses. He needed them. Since before noon, he had been putting off the walk to the ditch out in the field because the air was clogged with an evil, eye-smiting smoke. Those glasses, he had been telling himself, would surely ease the day's sting. Long before his eyes had started smarting and his sinuses had begun to throb, and even before that hassle he just had with those two hitchhikers down in the yard, he'd been telling himself that this dreary day was going to be a real bastard without some kind of rose-colored armor. As he paced past his window, he heard the heartbroken bleeding of the mother's sheep start up again, baffled and insistent, twisted by the hot distance. He pushed the curtain back from the sunlight and looked out over his yard into the field, shading his eyes. He couldn't see the lamb because of the thistle and Queen Anne's lace, but three ravens still marked the spot. They eddied above the ditch, arguing over the first morsels. Farther away, in the ash grove, he could see the ewe bleeding against her rope, and further, farther still, past the fence, the backs of the two hitchhikers. Little was visible beyond that. Mount Nebo was only a dim line drawn into the hanging smoke. The farm was uncommonly quiet for this hour. The usual mid-afternoon sound seemed to be held in one of those tense silences that ordinarily prompts the peacock to scream. One New Year's Eve, that big bird had called steadily during the half minute of burning fuse before Buddy's cannon went off and last week he had screamed horribly within the seconds of the first lightning that cracked the iron sky into a tumultuous thunderstorm. A storm would be a relief now, Devery thought. Even the peacock's horrible squawk would be welcome, but nothing. Only the little clock radio on his desk. He left it on for the news, but it was playing Barbara Streisand, singing on a clear day, etc. Terrific, he thought. Then above the music and the distant grieving of the sheep, he heard another sound, a high, tortured whine. Certainly no relief, whatever it was. At length, he was able to make out the source. Squinting down the road toward the highway, he saw a little pink car coming, fast and erratic. One of those new compacts with a name he couldn't remember, some animal, a cobra or a mink or a wildcat, with transmission trouble, whatever the beast was. It squealed around the corner past the Olson farm and the Birch Place and came boring on through the smoky afternoon with a whine so piercing and a heading so whimsical and wild that the hitchhikers were forced from the shoulder of the road into the snake grass. The blonde gave it the finger, and the black beard heard, hurled some curse at its passing. It screamed on past the barn, out of sight, and finally hearing. Debris left the window and began again his distracted search. I'm certain they're up here someplace, he said, certain of no such thing. The radio on his desk interrupted the regular program to bring more news from Attica. The announcer was young and very concerned about the latest atrocities connected with the prison re revolt. His voice was very sincere and husky in that intimate, under-the-cover style used by FM announcers, especially when they're, announcing, when they're addressing their followings with important news of the revolution. This husky adolescent intimacy struck Debris as hypocritical, even exploitive. What did some snot-nosed hippie DJ know about blacks or atrocities or pulling hard time in a feds joint? or about revolution either, for that matter. His eyes finally fell on his dog-eared rolling box, and he took it from the shelf. He gazed in at the seeds and stems. Maybe enough could be clean for one now, but unlikely enough for one now and one later both. Better save it for later. Need it more later. And just as well, he thought, looking at the box in his hands, the little brown seeds were rattling all over the place. He was still trembling too violently with the surge of adrenaline to have managed the chore of rolling. As he returned the rattling box to its niche in the shelf, he recalled an old phrase his father used to use, shaking like a dog shitting peach pits, aren't you? <laughs> He'd been up two days. He'd been up two days, grassing and speeding, and ransacking his mental library, or was it three, for an answer to his agent's call about the fresh material he had promised his editor, 
and his wife's query about the fresh cash needed by the loan office of the bank, but mainly since yesterday's mail, for an answer to Larry McMurtry's letter. Larry was an old friend from Texas. They'd met at a graduate writing seminar at Stanford and had immediately disagreed about most of the important issues of the day, beatniks, politics, ethics, and especially psychedelics. In fact, about almost everything except for their mutual fondness and respect for writing and each other. It was a friendship that flourished during many midnight debates over bourbon and book lore, with neither the right or the left side issues gaining much ground. Over the years since Stanford, they tried to keep up the argument by correspondence, Larry defending the traditional and Debory championing the radical. But without the shared bourbon, the letters naturally lessened. The letter from Larry yesterday was the first in a year. Nevertheless, it went straight back at the issue, claiming certain advances, listing the victories of the righteous right, and pointing out the retreats and mistakes made by certain left-wing luminaries, like Manson, whom Debory had known slightly. The letter ended by asking, in the closing paragraph, So, what has the good old revolution been doing lately? Debris' research had yielded up no satisfactory answer. After hours of trial and chemistry before the typewriter, he had pecked out one meager page, but the victories he had listed on his side were largely mundane achievements. Claude and Blanche had another kid. Rampage and I finally got cut loose from our three-year probation. And that was certainly no great score on the left wing of the ledger. In fact, keeping one's nose clean during the drag of that three-year legal tail probably put hours, put points on the right. But that was all he could think of, one puny page to show for 40 hours prowling around in that lonely library of what he used to call the movement. 40 hours of thinking, drinking, peeing in a milk bottle, with no break except that 10-minute trip downstairs to deal with those pilgriming prickheads. And now... Back upstairs, and still badly shaken, even that feeble page was missing. The typed yellow sheet of paper was as misplaced as his colored glasses. Fox on both houses, he moaned aloud, rubbing his irritated eyes with his wrists. On fucking field burners poisoning the air for profit, and on fucking flower children gone to seed and thorn. He rubbed until the sockets filled with sparks, and then he lowered his fists and held both arms tight against his sides in an attempt to calm himself by standing straight, and breathing steady. His chest was still choked with adrenaline. Those California goddamn clowns, both smelling of patchouli oil and cheap sweet wine and an angry, festering vindictiveness. Of threat, really. They reeked of threat. The older of the two, the Blackbeard, had stopped the barking of McKellar's pair of Great Danes with only a word. Shut, he had hissed, the sound slicing from the side of his mouth. The dogs had immediately turned tail back to the bus. Debry hadn't wanted to interfere, interface with the pair when he saw them come sauntering in, all long hair and dust and multi-patched Levi's. But Betsy was a worry with the kids up Fall Creek, and it was either go down and meet them in the yard or let them saunter right on into the house. They called him brother when he came down to greet them, an endearment that always made him watch out for his wallet. And the younger one had lit a stick of incense to wave around while they told their tale. They were brothers of the sun. They were on their way back to the hate, coming from the big doings at Woodstock, and had decided they'd meet the famous devil and Debris before going on south. Rest a little, rap a little, maybe riff a little, you know what I'm saying, bro. As Debris listened, nodding, Stuart had trotted up carrying the broken bean pole. Don't go for Stuart's stick, by the way. He addressed the younger of the pair, a blonde bearded boy with a gleaming, milk fed smile and new motorcycle boots. Stuart's like an old drunk with his sticks. The more you throw it, the more lushed out he gets. Look how red eyed he is already. The dog dropped the stick between the, boy, the new boots and looked eagerly into the boy's face. For years, I tried to break him of the habit, but he just can't help it when he sees certain strangers, like reporters or probation officers. I finally realized it was easier training the stick throwers than the stick chasers. So just ignore it, okay? Tell him no dice. Pretty soon he goes away. Whatever, the boy had answered, smiling. You heard the man, Stuart. No dice. The boy had kicked the stick away, but the dog had snagged it from the air and planted himself again before the boots. The boy did try to ignore it. He continued his description of the great scene at Woodstock, telling dreamily what a groove it had been, how high, how happy, how everybody there had been looking for Devlin Debery. Hey, you should have made it, man. It was stone groove. The dog grew impatient and picked up his stick and carried it to the other man, who was squatting in the grass on one lean haunch. Just tell him no dice, Debris said to the side of the man's head. 
Beat it, Stuart. Don't pester the tourists. The other man smiled down at the dog without speaking. His beard was long and black and extremely thick, and the salt of age was beginning to sprinkle the mouth and ears. As his profile smiled, Devery watched two long incisors grow from the black bramble of his mouth. The teeth were as yellow and broken as the boys were perfect. This dude, Devery remembered, had kept his face averted while they were shaking hands. He wondered if this was because he was self-conscious about his breath, like a lot of people with bad teeth. Well, what's happening, man? What's doing? What's all this? Blonde boy was beaming about at his surroundings. Boss place you got here, I gotta say. All this garden and trees and shit. I can see you're into the land. That's good. That's good. We're getting it together to get a little place outside of Petaluma as soon as Bob's here, his old lady dies. Be good for the soul. A lot of work, though, right? Watering and feeding and taking care of all this shit. Keeps you occupied, Debris had ventured. Just the same, the boy rambled on. You should have made it back there to Woodstock. Primo. That's the only word. Acres and acres of bare titty and good weed and out of sight music. Vibes. You get me, man? Vibes. So I've heard, Debris answered, nodding pleasantly at the boy. But he couldn't take his mind off the other hitchhiker. Blackbeard shifted his weight to the other hunch, the movement deliberate and restrained, careful not to disturb the dust that covered him. His skin was deeply tanned and his hair tied back, so the leather-like cords in his neck could be seen working as he followed the dog's imploring little tosses of the stick. He was without any clothes from the waist up, but not unadorned. He wore a string of eucalyptus berries around his neck and two leather wristbands on each long arm. A jail tattoo, made, Debris recognized, by two sewing needles lashed parallel at the end of a matchstick and dipped in India ink, covered his left hand. A blue-black spider with legs extending down all five fingers to the ragged nails. At his hip he carried a bone-handled skinning knife and a beaded sheath, and across his knotted belly a long scar run diagonally down out of sight into his Levi's. Grinning, the man watched Stuart prance up and down before him with a three-foot length of broken bean steak dripping in his mouth. Back off, Stuart, Debris commanded. Leave this guy alone. Stuart, don't bother me, the man said, his voice soft from the side of his mouth. Everything's got to have its trip. Encouraged by the soft voice, Stuart, Stuart sunk, sank to his rump before the man. This pair of motorcycle boots were old and scuffed. Unlike his partners, these boots had tromped many a bike to life. Even now, dusty and still, they itched to kick. That itch hung in the air like the peacock's unsounded cry. Blonde boy had become aware of the tenseness of the situation at last. He smiled and broke his in stick, in incense and dug the smoking through the smoking half into the quince bush. Anyhow, you should have dug it, he said. Half a million freaks in the mud and the music. He was beaming impishly from one participant to the other, from debris to his partner to the prancing dog. <coughs> as he picked at his wide grin with the dyed end of the incense stick. A half a million beautiful people. They'd all sensed it coming. Debris had tried once more to avert it. Don't pay him any mind, man. He's an old stick junkie. But it had been a half-hearted try, and Stuart was already dropping the stick. It had barely touched the dusty boot before the squatting man scooped it up and in the same motion side-armed it into the grape arbor. Stuart bounded after it. Come on, man, Stuart had pleaded. Don't throw it for him. He goes through wire and thorns and gets all cut up. Whatever you say, Blackbeard had replied, his face averted as he watched Stuart trotting back with the retrieved stake. Whatever's right, then had thrown it again as soon as Stuart dropped it, catching and slinging it, slinging it all in one motion, so fast and smooth that Devery wondered if he had been a professional athlete at a younger time, baseball or maybe boxing. This time the stick landed in the pig pen. Stuart flew between the top two strands of barbed wire and had the stick before it stopped cartwheeling. It was too long for him to jump back through the wire with. He circled the pigs lying in the shade at the end of their shelter and jumped the wooden gate at the far end of the pen. I mean, everything's got to have its trip, don't you agree? Debris had not responded. He was already feeling the adrenaline surge in his chest and burn in his throat and knew there was no more to say. Blackbeard stood up. Blind boy had continued to smile as he stepped close to his companion and whispered something at the hairy ear. All Devlin could make out was... Be cool, Bob. Remember what happened in Boise, Bob. Everything's got to live, Blackbeard had answered, and everything's got to die. Stuart skidded to a halt in the gravel. Blackbeard grabbed one end of the stick before the dog could release it, wrenching it viciously from the animal's teeth. This time, Debris, moving with all the speed and adrenaline that the adrenaline could wring from his weary limbs, had stepped in front of the hitchhiker and grabbed the other end of the stick before it could be thrown. 
I said, don't throw it. This time, there was no averting the grin. The man looked straight at him, and Debra had guessed right about the breath. It hissed out of the jagged mouth like a rotten wind. I heard what you said, buttfuck. And then they had looked at each other, over the stick, grasped at each end between them. Devery forced himself to match the other man's grinning glare with his own steady smile, but he knew it was only a temporary steadiness. He wasn't in shape for encounters of this caliber. There was a seething accusation burning from the man's eyes, unspecified, undirected, impersonal, really, but so furious that Devery felt his will withering before it. Through the beanstalk, he felt that fury assail his very st- cells. It was like holding a high-voltage terminal. Everything has got to try, the man said through his ragged grin, shuffling to get a better grip on his end of the stake with both leathery hands. And everything's... <coughs> he didn't finish. Debris had brought his free fist down, sudden and hard, and chopped the stake in twain. Then, before the man could react, had turned abruptly away from him and swatted Stuart on the rump. The dog had yelped in surprise and run away under the barn. It had been a dramatic and successful maneuver. Both hitchhikers were impressed. Before they could recover, Debris had pointed across the yard with the ragged end of it, the jagged end of his piece and told them, There's the trail onto the Hate Ashbury guys. Five Central. <laughs> Come on, Bob, Ron Boy had said, sneering at Debris. Let's hit it. Forget him, he's fucked, you know? Like Leary and Lennon, all those high rolling creeps. Fucked. A power tripper. Blackbeard had looked at his end. It had broken off some inches shorter than Debris. He finally muttered, Whatever's shaken and turned on his heel. As he sauntered back the way he had come up the yard, he had drawn his knife. The blonde boy hurried to take up his saunter beside his partner, already murmuring and giggling up to him.